Okay. Are you up for a discussion around a touchy subject? One that scratches on racism, fascism, and whose lives we assign value? I thought so. You are on the internet, so. Uh, yeah. Let's get into it. We're talking about population, and we're gonna need to take this on the road. Yeah, hold up. Before we go, I am all about conversations that are built around genuine curiosity and sincere questions and all that, but when comments get uh, unproductive and are just plain dehumanizing, I delete that stuff so fast to make sure it's a waste of the commenter's time that no one no one sees it. So, yeah, uh, we gotta lay that down before we go. And now let's take this to the most populated country on Earth. No, not there. There we go. It's 2023 and I'm in India, which is significant because this year, India becomes the world's most populated country. India is set to overtake China to become the most populous country in the world by the middle of this year. That's according to data released by the United Nations. Now, the new estimate is 1.4 billion. For a long time, this title has belonged to China, but around 20 years ago, its population growth started to slow down. Just about now, people believe that China has reached peak population and will see a downward trajectory for years to come. On the other hand, India's population continued to rise as quickly as ever, and it isn't expected to peak until as late as 2064. It'll be the most populated country on Earth for quite a while. I was prepared to land in India and immediately be greeted with noise, crowds, heat, and hustle. And while I would eventually find those things, they weren't as upfront and jarring as most people led me to expect. Quiet, which you don't hear too often. I was expecting much more hustle. India has changed a lot over the years. This place and its population are way more nuanced than most people report. Take, for instance, the way India's population is distributed. It's a large country both in terms of land and people, but the majority of people live in the northwest of the country. So what happens when population grows and grows and grows? In late 2022, the world population passed the 8 billion mark. It'll likely hit 9 billion in 2037. Sometimes big numbers are hard to grasp, so here's one other way to look at it. 70 years ago, the world only had about 2.5 billion people. If you know a 70-year-old, there are now three times the amount of people in the world compared to when they were born. And that has brought up the concern of overpopulation. When it comes to the environment, population can be a misunderstood statistic. People often look at that rising number and sound the alarm. You guys are killing me up here! I'm dying here! I'm dying! However, with this concern, comes a lot of misunderstanding. Now, if I were going into this cold with no background whatsoever and it was just presented with the numbers of what population growth looked like, the reality of famine and food scarcity, the challenge of climate change and rising emissions, then yeah, I would conclude that population growth is a scary thing. I remember hearing someone once say the quickest way to blow up your carbon footprint is to have kids and mathematically that kind of makes sense because yeah, you're just uh, increasing the overall number of footprints that are going to have a very similar lifestyle to you. Uh, but you know, A, the notion of a carbon footprint is kind of a loaded one, and B, there's more to caring for the planet than just a balance sheet. There's one really easy thing you could do to green your life and that's not have a child. <laughs> Well then, who exactly are we saving the Earth for? I think you should be able to have kids or not have kids as you please, and I don't think your environmental morality or your value as a human being hinges on this, okay? But at the surface, I see how that concern makes some sense. Because while the rhetoric around overpopulation carries a lot of baggage, you can't really blame every single person who feels worried about it. That's not the problem. Based on the information that most people have, worry seems rational. The problem is what happens when people stoke those worries into something awful. Maybe 3.30 in the afternoon, but it already looks much later and that's all because of the storm. Uh, lots is still happening though. Although apparently if I was here not in the rain, this would be even more active. Concern over overpopulation is an old phenomenon. 
You can go all the way back to 1798 when the world only had about a billion people, yet Thomas Malthus wrote an essay called An Essay on the Principles of Population. He expressed his concern that the world's population was growing too fast and that there wouldn't be enough food or agricultural production to sustain it all. If you look at the concern through Malthus' perspective, it kind of makes sense. What, what was more extreme was the solution he proposed. Divest from the poor, let them die quicker, have fewer kids, and curb the population growth. He believed that people were poor because they lacked morals, so the sacrifice was justified. He even had really specific and horrible suggestions on how to go about it, including having them live on narrower streets, increasing the likelihood that the plague would spread among them. I really wish we could say this was the musing of an 18th century madman, but if you look at his philosophy against the backdrop of our behaviors in the present day, we're not doing that much better. Sometimes it's strange to see people I really respect, like Jane Goodall or David Attenborough, mention overpopulation as a concern while also hearing white nationalists like Stephen Miller or Nick Fuentes use similar sounding phrases. And then finally, we cannot, we cannot hide away from human population growth because, you know, it underlies so many of the other problems. All these things we talk about wouldn't be a problem if there, were, if there was the size of population that there was 500 years ago. The size of your population matters very much. The size determines a nation's character. It often determines its fate. Now, I don't want to draw a false equivalence here. Jane Goodall then goes on to advocate for expanding family planning and education, while Carlson goes on to say we should just stop immigration altogether. Uh, these are definitely not the same thing. But it's interesting how the rhetoric used to get to these very different conclusions can take similar notes. And that's what I wanted to point out, is how confusing this can get. Thomas Malthus's way of thinking set the stage for this conversation for a long time. This idea that in order to protect nature, we need to restrict people. I've already made a whole video around the establishment of our earliest national parks and how those displaced indigenous families. And I've referenced Theodore Roosevelt's outlook on environmentalism. The world had about two billion people when he echoed some of Thomas Malthus's recommendations saying, society has no business to permit degenerates to reproduce. Half a century after this, you had a prominent biologist named Paul Ehrlich rise to fame because of his book, The Population Bomb. The world was at about 3.5 billion people when he called for a conscious regulation of the number of human beings. When you hit pause and think about what that might mean, it's easy for us to see where things can go off the rails. In retrospect, we can see why this way of thinking is so problematic, but back then, Paul Ehrlich was widely celebrated at Earth Day events. These ideas spread, and people started acting on them. In 1976, Indira Gandhi's administration oversaw the mass sterilization of 8.3 million men. The US government enacted forced sterilization practices on Peruvian, Puerto Rican, and Native American women. Throughout the 2010s, this rhetoric branches off into replacement theory the concerns over what happens when a white population gets outnumbered. And late in that decade, with the world population over 7 billion, we had mass shooters in Texas, New York, and New Zealand cite the environment and sustainability as their rationale behind their violence. They were literally greenwashing murder. Okay, are environmentalists anti-people? Now I know my answer and it's of course not, no. In fact, the main reason why I'm motivated to take care of our planet is that restoring an ecosystem can seriously help people. It can prevent families from living in poverty, it can stop someone's home from being washed away by a flood, it can make it so a father doesn't have to leave his family and go look for work in a city. Now I do have to concede a couple things. I do often hear of people express frustration about the way humans have poorly taken care of the planet in a way that frames it so that it sounds like humans are the problem. I mean, think of the 2020 lockdowns when you had uh, all these people I mean, think of the lockdowns in 2020 when you had people talk about how nature is healing and how humans were the problem, humans were the virus. You can kind of see how that would affirm some people's worries. And this is why indigenous leadership in environmentalism is so important. Because from more indigenous perspectives, humans are a part of nature. There's not this duality. And so you can't care for the environment while being anti-people because that's part of the environment. It just doesn't make sense. When people start using the environment 
to justify excluding human beings, pay attention. It's usually a certain kind of human being that they're trying to exclude. There's this long entanglement between conservation and racism that's had some pretty horrifying results. Some of the most terrible events of the 20th century were stoked in exactly this way. Pay attention to dehumanizing language. Like when you hear a group of migrants being referred to as a swarm. Migrants swarm across the southern border. The way you refer to insects, that's a huge red flag. I mean, these proposals measure their successes just in terms of population, rather than something that is more reflective of environmental health, like carbon emissions. So typically, the myth of overpopulation follows this path. The people are coming from over there. There are too many people. Chaotic, crowded cities are a dystopian nightmare. We need tighter borders. In a lot of places, American border cities, European countries, a lot of this blame is placed on migrant populations. You have some leaders who argue that population in the Global South has fueled climate change. The thing is, the Global South is not responsible for climate change. One of the most common things you see is people villainizing cities and depicting them as dystopian crime hubs. Crime, safety, lack of police patrol. How bad does this city look to the rest of the world? It looks pretty bad, Phil. And one of the biggest examples of this was uh, Paul Elric's book, The Population Bomb. It opened by describing a drive through New Delhi and him being encountered by just crowds of people and trash and public urination. At the time, a lot of his critics said, you know, you could have chosen New York or LA as your example. Back then, even Detroit was bigger than Delhi, but you just had to pick an Asian city for this. Another irony is that at some scale, cities can actually be good for the environment. Yes, you get really intense human activity concentrated in one spot, so it, it takes a worse toll on that particular spot. But the alternative is to spread that out wider, and by concentrating it, at least you're minimizing the disruption to biodiversity. Finally, whenever people use climate change as a rationale to tighten their borders, it just doesn't make sense, because you, you still contribute emissions no matter where you live, the atmosphere doesn't recognize political boundaries. Keeping people outside your man-made lines is not going to change much. You still have to find another way to deal with the emissions problem. Population can be a misunderstood statistic. People often see that rising number and sound the alarm. But in reality, there are different metrics we should be paying attention to. We need to look at emissions, for example. And we can look at emissions per capita to see how those are most concentrated based on where people live and how they live. When you take the time to unpack those numbers, here's what you're gonna find. Quickly growing populations tend to be in lower income countries. The relationship between poverty and population growth is very well established. People living in poverty tend to have a lot more kids and there are a lot of reasons for this, but in general, some of them are uncertainty, uh, limited opportunities, a lack of education, uh, a rural lifestyle. You've got to note that strong correlation between infant mortality or the average age of a country and the rate of its population growth. Families are often bigger where moms and babies have a lower likelihood of survival, sadly. Now, what this all means is that as countries make progress against poverty, their population growth slows way down. At the same time, people live longer, healthier lives. Over the recent history of the past century, we have a lot of strong examples of this. Places like South Korea. Between 1960 and 2020, the level of income per capita grew 24 times. At the same time, the average number of babies born per woman fell drastically, from six down to one. The trend is that as incomes improve, as health improves, as people start living longer, the number of children per family goes down. And this is such a strong trend, I can't think of a single country that goes outside this example. The world is now eight times the size it was when Thomas Malthus started expressing his concerns of being able to feed everyone. We actually haven't seen a shortage of resources. We've had failures to make sure that everybody has access to the resources that are there. As we create the conditions for less poverty, more education, healthier families and longer lives, we're essentially creating the conditions where population growth takes care of itself. Population is a tricky topic. 
but it's an important one to talk about. So thanks for hanging.